established in 1998, 23 years ago by Tony Castro. Unity Through Diversity Week is an educational programming series that celebrates, focuses, um, and explores the rich intersections of our global communities through workshops, presentations, uh, performances, et cetera. Um, as you know, the coronavirus has impacted our community beyond description. Um, and despite everything that's happening around the world, we're so grateful um, to be here with you today, virtually, to connect with our community, with our familia, especially at this time. Since February, our committee consisting of faculty, staff, and students um, has worked tirelessly in making Unity Week happen. Um, I would love to give a special thank you to our Unity Week committee, uh, consisting of incredible colleagues across campus, Sean McFessel, Saini Fuli, Betty Vera, Diego Luna, Gio Mark Panello, Shannon Waits, Edwina Fuli, Bob Scribner, Georgia Peary, and Marlena Ferretti. Without you, this week would not have been possible. I know collectively we were thinking how we would make this happen um, since we're so used to being together and brainstorming and being in community. But despite all of these efforts, everything that's occurred and being able to be in community through Zoom the last month and a half to make this happen, I am so immensely grateful for each one of you in making this happen. Additionally, I would love to give a special thank you as well to ITS, Access Services, and to Mark Lentini, who has been answering numerous questions. Uh, Mark is from Instructional Design. Um, I want to thank him for his expertise in navigating our first signature programming week through Zoom webinar. And this is a task, y'all. So Mark, thank you so much. Um, and ensuring that all of our events are accessible with live captioning and ASL interpretation. So without further ado, I would love to introduce Shannon Waits, who will introduce our opening keynote speaker. Enjoy y'all. Thank you, Doris. And a big shout out to the Unity Week team who is holding down the back end of this presentation for us all. Good afternoon, Highline community, near and far. It is my incredible honor to introduce our Unity Week keynote speaker, Rosa Clemente. Pre-corona, our committee was thinking about a theme, which means discussing where we, our collective we, our students, our local and global community, where we are at this moment in time and what programming would speak to it. We lifted up ideas of collective liberation and community care and what it means to reclaim your education, your story, your brilliance, to rewrite the narrative through unlearning and relearning what was there all along. Community, resilience, knowledge, power, and the ability to take care of each other. Rosa Clemente was a natural choice. Uh, as someone who is embedded in and has researched liberation struggles and speaks to the critical importance of mutual aid or collective care as an antidote to capitalism. We didn't know at the time how important these topics would be but in our current moment, they are essential to our path forward. Rosa Alicia Clemente is an organizer, political commentator, and independent journalist. An Afro-Puerto Rican born and raised in the Bronx, New York, she has dedicated her life to organizing, scholarship, and activism. From Cornell to prisons, Rosa is one of her generation's leading scholars on the issues of Afro-Latinx identity. Rosa is the president and founder of Know Thyself Productions, which has produced seven major community activism tours and consults on issues such as hip hop feminism, media justice, voter engagement among youth of color, third party politics, United States political prisoners, and the right of Puerto Rico to become an independent nation free of United States colonial domination. She is a frequent guest on television, radio, and online media as her opinions on critical current events are widely sought after, which is why it's so great she's here with us today. She, uh, where are we at? Her groundbreaking article, Who is Black?, published in 2001, was the catalyst for many discussions regarding Black political and cultural identity in the Latinx community. 
She is the creator of PR, Puerto Rico on the map, an independent, unapologetic, Afro-Latinx centered media collective founded in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. She is currently completing her PhD at the W.E.B. Du Bois Center at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, Rosa was the first ever Afro-Latina woman to run for Vice President of the United States in 2008 on the Green Party ticket. She and her running mate, Cynthia McKinney, were to this date the only women of color ticket in American history. Rosa Clemente speaks truth to power and we are in store for some facts. Please join me in welcoming Rosa. Um, somebody else has to start the video. Okay, here we go. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's, yeah, the whole world has changed dramatically for a very, very long time. So I just wanted to share some of my, some of my experiences of how I became an organizer and how I stayed in, in the movement. Um, and been part of a lot. I hope I didn't. I hope people could still see me. I'm trying to figure out the PowerPoint at the same time. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now this is um, I'm trying to see. I don't see myself when I have the PowerPoint up. We can see you. you oh, you can. Okay. Self. No, that's fine. As as long as you could see me, and then everybody could see that PowerPoint, right? Yep. And so then that, if you want to click on presenter view of the PowerPoint. Right. Yep. Um, okay. So people can see me still and see the PowerPoint. Yes, indeed. Oh, okay. Great. Um, I just want to read a little bit of something that I had prepared and then just go through. It looks like a lot of slides, but I'm going to go through them really quickly so we could spend a good amount of time on Q&A. So I love quotes. Um, sometimes a good quote can get you through a day or a couple of days. So and I want to thank everybody that's on right now. I know like everybody's getting very uh, stressed about not having human contact as well as Zoom meetings and virtual things. As an organizer, it's not in our DNA to not be around people. So we've had to adjust to maintain social distance. I'm based in New York, but you are all based, I'm pretty sure in Washington state. So both of our states, yours was hit earlier and now New York, New York, not the entire state, but New York City is still dealing with a lot of, of not only patients, but a lot of people um, continuing to die um, because they can't quite figure out what would be, what is good, how this thing started, let alone a cure for it. So um, Bell Hook says, education at its best is a profound human transaction called teaching and learning. It is not just about getting information or getting a job. Education is about healing and wholeness. It is about empowerment, liberation, transcendence, about renewing the vitality of life. It is about finding and claiming ourselves and our place in the world. So this is how my story begins. So people could find me, they could tweet at Rosa Clemente, Instagram, Black Puerto Rican PhD. For me, my story begins in the South Bronx in 1972. I was born in the Bronx when the Bronx was burning. Um, I was born in the Bronx when there was extreme, extreme amounts of poverty. Although the section that I grew up in, in the Bronx is still the poorest congressional district in America, but we do have the best congressperson ever, AOC. So, you know, that should let people know that um, Poverty is not something that keeps people from practicing or organizing, although there are a lot of systemic wrongs that come with poverty, of 
of course, but I didn't grow up in what people will call a movement household. I have a lot of friends, most of them, their parents were in, in movements in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, so they were all growing up in movement spaces. I did not grow up in a movement space or a movement household. I did have a great sense of pride about being Puerto Rican, um, but it wasn't until I got to college that I began to even understand why Puerto Rico is a colony, why we have political prisoners, why our women were tested on um, and sterilized, why people fighting to be free in Puerto Rico were either attacked, assassinated, or incarcerated for fighting for Puerto Rico to be free. I had to go to college to find that out. So when I was nine, my parents moved us into the suburbs. Okay, so I grew up, like I said, in the poorest congressional district, and then 21 miles away, at, when I was nine, my parents moved us to this suburb called Westchester County. Probably everybody knows Westchester County now because it had the first outbreak, and um, a part of Westchester County was in New York where the first outbreak, uh, community outbreak was happening, and that was New Rochelle, New York. So I grew up in the suburbs, but every weekend my parents, my mom would take me to the Bronx so we would maintain our connections with so much of my family in the Bronx. And my father to this day still owns his business over 50 years in the Bronx. You know, so my mom would take us and then the older I got and I lived in this small, small community called Elmsford, New York, was like one mile. It's not even the city, it's a village. You know, and I grew up, so every, for five days, I was in like this utopic kind of high school where it was very racially diverse. Um, none of us were expected not to go to college. We all participated in all parts of the community. I mean, I was a cheerleader, I ran track, I was in Rotary Club, Key Club, I was student government, all that kind of stuff. But the older I got, I was realizing that my cousins were not going to get the same opportunities that I would get. And I, at that time, wouldn't have had the language to say, well, it's structural, economic inequality is the reason a lot of my cousins did not go to college and a lot of them um, have been in the same place they've been in for 40 years and um, haven't been able to kind of break out of um, not as individually out of systemic oppression or, or economic in inequality it's just that the resources are never given to us in our communities so when i did go to college um in 1990s seems like forever i went to the state university of new york in albany new york albany new york is where i'm at now albany you all know now is the capital because governor cuomo who it, it's interesting because the only people that really like governor cuomo are people who don't live in new york state um he has he has done a lot at this current crisis um but he's doing exactly what he should be doing. So for us in New York, there's a lot of things he's been doing wrong for a very long time that this um, coronavirus has also exposed the amount of inequity in the state of New York, particularly in New York City. Um, so I'm just checking in since I can't see myself, but I'm everybody hears me and I'm good, right? Hello? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry, I had to drink water, so dry in my house. Um, so when I went to college, I joined up with a student organization called the SUBA, the Albany State University Black Alliance. And from there I became, a, that's how I began to understand what it means to be a leader. Um, the, the student affairs office, that time it was called minority affairs. We don't use that language anymore, thank God. But you know, in, in these spaces is where not only did I begin to understand the history of my people, the history of the African-American struggle, of, of feminism, of LGBTQ issues, of um, Asian Pacific Islander -ish issues, you know, and it was because our professors and our administrators encouraged us that my professors encouraged me to get into black studies and understand the roots of Puerto Rico. You know, they also got me to kind of come out of my shell. 
because I was very shy. I, I just kind of observed the four, first year that I was in school. I just wanted to do good. I want to make sure I was graduating from college. But it wasn't until late in my sophomore year that I became or put me on the track to the person that I am now. And it was because of this professor that you all see right now, Dr. Vivian Verdell Gordon, who took me under her wing and told me that I should leave political science and, and join, um, uh, become a major in Africana studies and to really dig out the roots of African descendant people in Puerto Rico, which I wouldn't have ever, I never, was told that as a Puerto Rican, even though my father's visibly a black man, like he's black, but it's just for in the nineties, especially, but in the Latino community, we mostly view ourselves through our ethnicity or our land or, or where we live. We don't, or we don't really do a great, uh, we don't talk about race well you know, at least not at that time. And even now, at least we are having major discussions of what it means to be an African descendant, what it means to be black as a Puerto Rican and all of those kind of things. But um, for me, as much as I learned in the classroom, it was like really hanging out with my friends, um, debating other people, going to see speakers, going to, um, you know, going to student uh, student council and saying, well, you're not giving the black and other groups the type of money you're giving to the the whatever Frisbee club or whatever those kind of different things that we had to contend with. But um, for me, Dr. Gordon saw something in me that I really wouldn't have seen in myself for a long, long time. And especially as a young woman, um, really not understanding patriarchy the way I understand it now you know so what I often tell students of color when you're coming to these institutions that first like you didn't get there by yourself the reason we are even in in these academic spaces um, institutionally is because there were people who fought for us to be in these institutions and it was part of a struggle of an era of the civil rights era and the black power movement era that really had millions of students demanding to not only be accepted at a college, but that the resources would be there and that they would they would be the same, that they would be on, have some type of equity with still what would be a, a white predominantly institutions, white, um, I'm sorry, white, white, predominantly white institutions, right? So, I think it's always important to students of color be very clear about these institutions and that a lot of times, most of the time, these spaces were not made for us. And I speak from an experience of going to a state school, going to an Ivy League, where I got my master's at Cornell University and UMass Amherst, another public university where I'm finishing my dissertation. But when I graduated, um, the man you see, his name is Dr. James Turner. I have met him through Dr. Gordon, and he said, you should come get your master's at Cornell University. And I was like, Cornell, that's Ivy League, like I could never get in there. And he said, no, you're going to come with us. We have our own department where we have our own building. Um, and you can come and study about the Young Lords Party because nobody has talked about the Young Lords. And the Young Lords were an organization in the late 60s, much like the Black Panther Party. Um, and, you know, kind of was a Marxist socialist organization that was all, all, also paramilitary, meaning that it, it, it sought the right for Puerto Rico to be free by any means necessary. And part of those means would be being a paramilitary organization, basically in the late 60s and 70s, you had a lot of organizations that began to take up arms in this country, or also talk about imperialism and war that the United States was, um, was imposing on so many other um, countries. So when I got to Cornell, I do remember one thing that Dr. I remember a lot that Dr. Turner said, I, but I do specifically remember when he said, you're not here to just get a master's from Cornell University. You're here to be a scholar activist. And that's what I've been in academic spaces for a long time. How, how do we use our scholarship for the betterment of our people? 
you know, sometimes we get lost in these um, white predominant institutions and we lose who we are or where we're, we don't want to really talk about who we are as a people or what has happened to us because, you know, understanding resistance and I mean, understanding oppression is not a fun thing like understanding the history of this country, the American project, really what it is, is this American project is, is, is predicated on three things. The denial of women to have any type of equity or equal rights with their husbands. You know, if the founding fathers didn't see the, the women in their lives as important or that they had the same equity, then how would they see black people that they were enslaving in the, in the United States of America? So, you know, that idea is that we sometimes come into these spaces and we're like, I don't want to start trouble. I'm just trying to graduate. But as a scholar activist, and we should all be scholar activists, you shouldn't just be going to get a degree, you know? But I also think with the coronavirus right now, that this is gonna change the entire trajectory of what the academy looks like, you know? Right now, you have a lot of universities that are saying they're gonna have to cut their spending by 25%. There's hiring freezes. Um, a lot of adjuncts are being let go. So it's, it's, it's weird to be in this space where I've been a scholar activist for 25 years, about to finish my PhD, and I don't know when I'll be able to teach, you know? But for me, what Dr. Turner really taught me is that you always have to do work in the community. And no matter what, that we just can't be um, taking the privileges that we have that so many of our people don't have to take them for granted is, is, is very problematic. And while I was there at Cornell for two years, I really did get to go into in-depth research of not only the Young Lords Party, but about, um, slavery in Puerto Rico. And one of the things that I've done post my master's is a lot of my work is really based around Afro-Latino, Latina, Latinx identity, and how I racially um, classify myself as Black, which for a lot of people is still very problematic, but that can be part of the Q&A. You know, so our scholarship that we produce is not just for us, but it's for our community. As scholar activists, we have the responsibility to use our serious scholarship to empower our communities, but to also understand that our communities are consistently under attack, that many of the people we know will never step foot into any institution of higher learning, but many people in our communities have organic knowledge, street knowledge through their lived experiences, and that we must never forget that or not form artificial barriers because we have a degree and some of us don't. And that's also a tenet of community organizing. A lot of times people think that community organizing is because you got hired at a nonprofit to do something. Community organizing is really first and foremost about letting the people that are closest to the problems to be the people that come up with the solutions. That we do not go into communities to impose what we think the agenda or the right way to protest or the wrong way to protest can be, that we really take you know, and listen to the people. And that's what we call grassroots organizing, literally from the bottom up, not from the top down. And, and in the last five years with a new generation of young leaders, black, brown, undocumented, native um, folks, a Asian Pacific Islanders, are you are all as younger people coming into a time period where all those intersectional intersections of your identities are not, you're not being asked to choose one or the other. When I was in college, literally people would be like, are you a Puerto Rican first or you're a woman? And you're like, how do you even separate those two? But we didn't have the language until Kimberly Crenshaw came up with her theory of intersectionality, you know? But when I talk too about the American um, project is that a lot of times we have to understand that the people that are being oppressed, that is not an individual oppression, that the that white supremacy and patriarchy, transphobia and capitalism, right, 
are part of the america it's a part of the american problem but it's a globe these are global issues as well you know so a lot of my work that i also do is uh, as a historian is trying to tell younger people that your history does not begin with our colonization you know and i think indigenous brothers and sisters have told us this forever that the history is a continuum of hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of years. And a lot of times with people of color in any setting, we talk a lot about of the oppression, which we should be talking about white supremacy and systemic inequity. We should be talking about that. We should be understanding that, you know, these things have been put upon us, right? But that our our people and what we bring to the table does not begin with colonization or capture enslavement or genocide right we have a history that predates all of the systemic oppression that's been inflicted on black and brown people right and that we are a diasporic people so you know black people all over the world they're in australia and they're in palestine and they're in new zealand and they're in puerto rico they're in cuba they're in brazil they're in the dominican republic like the reason it was called the transatlantic slave trade was because that's what it did it captured people on the continent of africa and it dispersed those people as enslaved people in most of the western hemisphere and a lot of people don't understand that the amount of Africans that were captured, there'll, there'll be people who debate this, but pretty historically at this point, people say 60 million to 70 million people were taken from the continent of Africa and dispersed throughout the world. But most of those people don't end up in the United States of America. So that's why when, you, when people are like, there's black people in Puerto Rico, I'm like, yes, because Puerto Rico had slavery <laughs> and the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Well, Haiti didn't. Haiti became the first um, black republic of the world that was independent. But of course, that there was slavery in, in Hispaniola, right? So what we don't understand sometimes is that we're like, where are all these black people? And it's like all over the world. We're all over the world. And that is part really of, of our not only disbursement but also it really speaks to how we've worked together as a people you know so as a historian i try to contextualize things by looking at the past understanding the present and knowing that the future is shaped by not only events but by people who struggle for justice so when I was about to graduate, before I went to Cornell here at SUNY Albany, this woman, Dr. Moreno Vega, she came to speak and she was the first Puerto Rican, first Hispanic, first Latina that I ever heard refer to herself as African descendant. And after she spoke, I chased her down and I was like, I'm gonna graduate and I wanna come work with your organization and she's like, well, you call me when you're in New York City, but here's a list of books that you need to read to understand who we are as a people of African descent. And, and what she gave me to read, it really brought an understanding to me about what people mean when they say an African diaspora, but what does it mean when people say we're African descendant people? So when I graduated from Cornell, I went to New York City. I started teaching. I was wanting to teach history. Um, a year into teaching, I left because at that time, um, well, people use the phrase now, the, the school to prison pipeline, but it, it was beginning in New York at the time I was teaching. And one day our principal called us in, you know, and he said, we're not going to be able to get new history books or English books this year. And I'm, I'm a, I was the history teacher because we need to build a holding cell in here. So if any of the kids um, come in or bring in gang violence or smoking weed, all that, we're gonna detain them in the school and wait for the police to come and, and arrest them and process them to juvenile detention. Now, mind you, this was middle school. I had eighth graders. 
And so I left. I said, I cannot be part of something where you're going to decide not to give me books and teach young people the history that they should be knowing because you want to have a holding cell in a school. Now, 20 years post that, everybody knows the school to prison pipeline, right? And that's kind of how I bring it all together. Sometimes when you're doing organizing, it doesn't seem like people are getting it or people are understanding or people are moving in the direction you think they should be moving. But this goes back to scholarship and activism. Those of us who have that type of information are the ones that should be doing studies in our community, should be writing the reports. But also, you always talk again to the people on the ground. They know what's up, and they're usually going to have the solutions to that. But after I wrote, wrote this article, Who is Black, it was very controversial back then because a lot of Latinos, Latina, Latinx folks were like, we don't, we're not, we're everything. We're multiracial, we're biracial. Why do you have to call yourself black? Why can't you just call yourself Puerto Rican or, or at that time Hispanic? And I was like, cause I'm a black Puerto Rican. And if you don't, you know, the problem was not me identifying with it as much as it was people saying like, why, why do you have to bring race into everything? You know, but um, this article you can find on my website. It's almost 20 years old, and every year it gets revived for a new generation. And it's not the greatest writing, but it's just really me sharing my experiences with how then understanding who I was as an Afri a person of African descent or a Black Puerto Rican that led me to organize with the organization that became my political home, the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. And coming into the Malcolm X grassroots movement is really where I began to really not only become a, a, a good community organizer, but philosophically to have a political ideology and to know what I was willing never to uh, concede to, right? Um, or what I wasn't going to do, you know? And to this day the malcolm x grassroots movement is alive and it's younger a lot of younger people in it but as a family we've all kind of gone not our different ways just geographically our different ways but i mean these are my comrades we talk all the time we're organizing in different spaces but at the end we also always think about what we learn and not in the malcolm x grassroots movement which is self-determination and so in this time that we're at now Self-determination could mean me deciding to run for um, vice president of the United States on the Green Party ticket with, after Cynthia McKinney uh, called and was like, do you want to be my vice presidential candidate? And I was like, yes, you know, because I want to at least be part of some political party that is talking about the issues that are really affecting um, what we were calling then the hip hop generation. Right, those of us who grew up in hip hop, not just around music, but really the politics and the culture and knowledge within hip hop, um, or becoming a hip hop journalist, as some of us began to be called, or being a woman and going into hip hop spaces and really telling men that, like, we're sick of the patriarchy, we're sick of the homophobia, um, the violence, and all of that. You know, so by the time I was, Cynthia asked me to run, I was considering myself a hip hop feminist. And that's a, a, a term that Joan Morgan, her book is called When Chicken Heads Come Home to Roost, where she coined this phrase of hip hop feminist. Like women like us who love hip hop, but we love it so much that we can also critique hip hop. And that's some of the work that I was doing, running for, for on the Green Party. You know, people can ask me questions. It's been like now 12 years. But I will say that it's interesting because the Green Party platform, um, if you look back at it, everything we've been advocating, we've been advocating for over 30 years. And now you see a lot of the, um, the, the platform stuff that we had in the Green Party now have kind of gone mainstream, which I think is fantastic, you know? I think it's great that we have someone like AOC who could link up with Bernie Sanders and talk about a Green New Deal and all of that. So, I mean, ideas are never, they're not stagnant, you know? And for some reason, 
maybe we were a little too ahead of our time in 2008, but now we know that, you know, at least for me, the reason I ran is because I wanted to bring really issues again of the hip hop generation, um, especially on mass incarceration, because at that time, um, we were massively incarcerating people. Now there's a movement to decarcerate, but um, in the early 90s to the early 2000s, I mean, that's where we go from having 400,000 people in prison in the United States to 2.7 million people. And a lot of that is because the, the, the crime bill um, that Bill Clinton passed as a Democrat and that a lot of Democrats, Black and Latinos included, signed onto that. So can I just get a time check? Because I want to make sure I have time for Q&A. Yeah, you have about 10 to 15 more minutes. Okay. So when I got to UMass Amherst um, after, a, after I ran for, for vice president with Cynthia, it was very hard for me and her to get hired. Um, there was a lot of animosity towards us. I mean, part of it was like, how dare you run against Barack Obama? You know, and part of it, me would always tell people, I was like, it's not like we're going to win. We're the Green Party. We're like just trying to get 5% of the vote so that we could break the two-party system. But we, we didn't achieve that then, and we haven't achieved it now. Um, and one, a professor from UMass Amherst called and said, you know, you need a break from just organizing. You've been through a lot with this run. Think about coming to UMass Amherst to get your PhD in Black Studies. And I went two years, two years after I ran. Um, but when I got to UMass Amherst and the first year I was there, there was a, a, a hip hop manager, his name is Chris Lighty, and he committed suicide. And at that time, you know, it's so weird because younger generations now, you all are very open to having discussions about mental health. But even in 2012, people were not having the level of discussions now around not, not just self-care, but really about mental health and what that means. You know, and after he killed him, he committed suicide. Um, a lot of his friends who were mostly men like 50 Cent and Russell Simmons and Puff Daddy and all these huge, huge Jay-Z, all these huge hip hop stars were like, there's no way he would have committed suicide. He had too much to live for. And then they started this conspiracy theory about maybe his wife had killed him. So I was like, this is crazy. We should be talking about this in hip hop. And I wrote, wrote an article where I came out with my story about dealing with postpartum depression, but also for a long time dealing with anxiety in my life and um, bipolar um, depression. And I could never really put my finger on it. Like, and it really got to a point personally where people would be like, oh, that's just Rosa, she's going off. And I had to keep thinking like, no, nah, this, there's something not right, you know? And I started doing my own research, but people were beginning to talk about mental health. So when he um, committed suicide, I wrote this article about how in the hip hop generation, we had to have serious and healing discussions, you know? So as one who suffers from depression myself, it breaks my heart to see those lose this very difficult and often lonely battle, you know? And, you know, I think it was, that article was, I needed to write it, but I didn't expect a little bit of the blowback I got on that. But the blowback came from people that are highly motivated and are always on the go, you know, that are in my life. And I was like, you're not taking time, like just taking a break. Also, um, three years before that, not only did, I mean, seven, sorry, seven years before that, not only had I had my daughter and didn't know that I really went through postpartum depression, I also went down down to New York and covered the aftermath of Hurricane um, Katrina and the levee breach in New Orleans. And, you know, to this day, you, you never forget pictures of people who are dead, basically. When we got there, the ninth fourth was still completely underwater. 
and there were bodies laying around and you know, I don't think I ever dealt with all of that trauma from Hurricane Katrina. I kind of just kept going, kept going, kept going. And then seven years later, kind of all caught up, you know. So in catching up, as I was finishing at UMass Amherst to go live, um, um, to get a post of pre-doc in, at California State University in L.A., um, I ended up joining Black Lives Matter. The first chapter did start in L.A., um, you see this picture right here with Talib Kweli and a poet Jessica Caremore and Philip Agnew of the Dream Defenders. Um, we also covered, well, I also went down with, with Talib and Jessica to support the rebellion that was happening in Ferguson. So if you look at it from the Trayvon Martin trial um, and George Zimmerman walking to then the Ferguson rebellion to then the two years of Black Lives Matter all over the country, trying to disrupt and, you know, all that comes with Black Lives Matter. I also um, wanted to also represent like Afro-Latinos. We consider ourselves Black. We're part of this like Black Lives Matter, but we as a Latino community also have to deal with the anti-Blackness in our communities. And we as a larger community have to stop like erasing Asians and Palestinians and indigenous people that if we're not in a multiracial show coalition we're not going to get things done so you know that you see ferguson and this is when we got arrested which is its own story itself because we had to go to trial for when we shut down the highway the 101 in california anybody that's been in cali the 101 is the biggest highway and we shut it down um on thanksgiving thanksgiving eve and then a couple years later i you know puerto rico happened and right after Hurricane Maria, I just gathered a group of young people that were very media savvy and was like, we have to go cover this right now. We have to get to the island because we're not going to really see the truth of what's happening on the ground. So we were able to, I created Puerto Rico on the map. We went to Puerto Rico. We traveled around for 10 uh, days. We got to see not only, unfortunately, the destruction, but really at that moment, what Puerto Rico taught me was this idea of mutual aid. Because by the time Trump threw the paper towels, people were already doing what they needed to do to survive, you know? Um, because so many people in Puerto Rico have been left behind, especially Afro Puerto Ricans, elderly people, people who live uh, in the mountains, all of them were totally abandoned. But in that abandonment came a new, consciousness in Puerto Rico. And what I mean about that is that for a long time, Puerto Rican people, you would, you know, how can we get free? How do we not be a colony anymore? How are we going to be able to be our own country? And a lot of people would say, well, what would we do without the U.S. government? Well, Hurricane Maria literally showed us what we can do without the U.S. government. And it just brought a different consciousness. And that's really a key part of community organizing, that most people become conscious of something that happens, something they see, or something that happens to them. That's usually what brings out your, your, your want to be not only treated right as a human being, but also like, what are we gonna do about this? Because if we don't do something, then we feel lost. Um, and then this was a two, three years now, I think. This was the, the um, Golden Globes. Three months before that, the Me Too, hash, Me Too hashtag uh, became, as you all know, so uh, popular. But Tarana Burke, who's right on point, that's Tarana right there. Tarana has started Me Too like 15 years before it became a hashtag. And um, this was the year that the Hollywood, a lot of Hollywood um, actresses came together for the Time's Up movement. And Tarana um, was invited and she said, no, I want to bring like seven or other women that are organizers and are doing great work. So for me, it was perfect timing because Puerto Rico had just happened in September. And then here comes this opportunity to go to the Golden Globes and spend a weekend talking to people that have money and resources about what they should be doing about Puerto Rico. 
But I always tell people the flips, the other side of that is that those Hollywood actresses also needed us as community organizers, you know, because a lot of people like will, will said to me, you know, they used you. And I was like, nobody used us. We're community organizers. Anytime I have a platform, we go to that platform. But really what I saw that weekend were all these powerful Hollywood actresses that had been abused in their whole career and had never had someone speak for them. Um, finally had some organizers like us like, no, you know, whether you work at Kentucky Fried Chicken or you work at a mall or you work, you know, at a, a TJ Maxx or you work in the fields or you work on a Hollywood set, like women are tired, like literally time's up. Women are tired of this and we're going to come together as women to talk about issues of patriarchy, you know, um, and to also understand that patriarchy, there are women who perpetuate patriarchy and there are men who do not perpetuate patriarchy perpetuate pa patriarchy, you know, and it's the same thing with LGB LGBTQ issues and trans people's issues. It's like one begets the other. So we have to always be talking about why this stuff is systematic. So I'm just gonna go through um, a couple more of the slides because I wanna now in this coronavirus time that we're in. So this is a mutual aid, um, um, that AOC Alejandro Ocasio Cortez had done with one of the baddest ass women organizers ever, Mariana Caba, you know, and basically they put this out to say, you know, listen, they're not, the government's not telling the truth. Trump and them are lying. Like we're going to have to depend on ourselves. And if you see it, you know, it's like, obviously things that we're all doing now, practice social distance, avoid public transit, clean, Service, you know, clean services often, but also like, where can you identify how you support a community? How do you support the people in your building or your block or your co-workers? Who can you work with? That what we talk about when we talk about organizing, it's solidarity, not charity. You know, how do we build a pod map of who can help with what issue? And that you should always not worry about starting small. You know, that it's usually a small group of people that make the most effective change. You know, so um, I hope you're able to download this. So I'll make sure that you all get it. I'm sure everybody's screenshotting it. But this is what I have on my wall, you know, like mutual aid. Who's going to help us? We're going to help ourselves. Basically, we got our block. You know, and I was reading something today about pandemics. And um, I don't have the author who wrote this, but it says historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew this one is no different it is a portal a gateway between one world or the next we can choose to walk through it dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred our data banks and dead ideas our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us or we can walk through lightly with little luggage ready to imagine another world are we ready to fight for it? And for me, I've been ready to fight for it, but I think this virus has really exacerbated and really also is a big check-in on organizers. Are we like effective enough? And if we're not, why aren't we affected enough? So you can screenshot this too. I had like two huge anxiety attacks as this was beginning to happen. Um, you know, part, partly because all my families in New York City, including my parents, and that I could not get to them, I couldn't see them um, because I would not want to get someone else sick. But um, I thought it was important again that people share like this thing is not only causing mad anxiety and panic, it is really devastating young people from like my daughter's age 15 to I would say 25. Because, you know, one day my daughter's in school and the next day she's not. And now a week later, like we have to have all these teachers and professors all of, all of a sudden be able to do online learning. And there's been many reports that students just in general, especially college students, actually do not like online classes like that. So it's going to be 
interesting to see not only what colleges do, but what high schools and middle schools do um, as they begin to open up again. You know, and for me, like so many people, at least maybe three weeks ago, were talking about going to normal. And I'm like, normal is what God is here. This is, if this is not a wake up from mother nature, then I don't know what it is. Life as we know it has changed. As my dear comrade Kali Okuno just wrote, we cannot, should not, and must not act like this is, has not changed. And then um, I probably have like three minutes if I may have less, but my husband is an essential worker. So, um, you know, the first two weeks, what I did begin to notice, right, and now what everybody knows now, is most domestic workers, most healthcare aides, most... <coughs> Most bus drivers, grocery workers, custodians are predominantly people of color. Most waitresses are predominantly single women and women of color. And with all this talk about reopening and all the talk about people not having PPE, my husband's a custodian and he's working in hot spots. The PPE he has, we have to buy it, you know. Um, and this great art, artist, is, if anybody's an artist, please check her out. Her name is Molly Crabapple. She did this series of sketches of workers for the Nation magazine. So that's my husband and his sketch. But then that's my husband's full protective gear that we had to find our, on our own as he is an essential worker. Um, I won't read this because it has a curse in it, but it'll just say, <laughs> well, it's here. And all this... <laughs> Essential real retail workers are heroes. Essential retail workers aren't heroes, they're hostages. They want to go home, they want to be safe, but they can't because they'll literally start to death on the streets because without their jobs, they'll be homeless with no health care and no food. And then I put up here for people who do want to do some organizing about mapping our roles in this new social change of the ecosystem that we're at. Like in the middle, we should always have equity and inclusion and liberation. Um, but also, who are the people who are going to experiment? What does it mean to be a frontline responder? What does it mean to build a vision? Who are the people ready to disrupt? and shut it down like who are the healers so we don't have to depend on doctors all the time where are other healing mechanisms that come from our communities like you know indigenous communities are being ravaged right now and and nothing in the mainstream media is talking about indigenous um native american people and the one thing that we should know is that you know indigenous people that that history that they get passed down is also a history that is also part and parcel of how not only can we be storytellers, but also healing in a way that is not just dependent on some pharmaceutical company. And then I just put some organizations here because there's so many great organizations doing incredible work, but that we really should think about this idea. Um, um, and also this is another, obviously protecting Asian American and Pacific Islander working people because the attack against Asian people have quadrupled and the Department of Justice doesn't want to put out those numbers, but there's community organizations all on the ground recording everything. But, um, and going back to this, this is something, a, a group in Atlanta, community movement builders. And look, these are the things we are under attack or not under attack these are the things that people need to live on food water shelter health care and safety and food there's a break in the supply chain water was already contaminated shelters were already and i mean shelter like your home um so many of our communities are gentrified we can't afford rent obviously everybody's being hit with not having health care for the most part you know, and again, having a very, very incompetent, um, I don't even know the words to use anymore to describe what is happening in the White House. Um, and then for those that do work against mass incarceration, there's an organization called RAP, Releasing Aging Prison Population, because here, this is where um, Cuomo looks good, 
but Cuomo hasn't released one person from Rikers or any of the state prisons. And the biggest outbreaks are happening in state prisons and in Rikers Island right now. And he refuses to let people out um, that are in Rikers because they don't have bail or on nonviolent felons. Um, this is from the Dream Defenders that could show you how do you demand de decarceration, which also includes ending ICE and abolishing ICE because there's so many people in detention that are, um, they're not putting out the numbers of how many young kids have been dying in ICE either. And then the fact that we even had to do a marathon like this, you know, with all these incredible people to get masks to people should really uh, wake people up. And then uh, when you get a chance, I did a great interview with AOC, um, obviously very powerful. You can see it on my website. It's just some of the new people, uh, some people I, I um, interviewed. I decided, you know, I can be home and have to be like isolated, but I'm always gonna do something. That's what I do. You know, I, the show I do now is called Disrupt the Chaos. I just started it. And I said, we need somebody out here that's really speaking to people, but particularly highlighting activists and um, artists. And everybody I've interviewed today, uh, to, to date is an activist and an artist. And I'll end with this, um, May Day is this Friday. There are gonna be May Day strikes all over the, the country, all over the world. Um, we're encouraging people not to go to work, um, which is a big ask. Um, we're encouraging people to not do online shopping and we're encouraging people to not pay rent, you know, to start things in your community to have rent strikes because we're not getting any of the money that's really being put out there. So what we're telling people is to strike in place, no shopping, no rent, no mortgages, cancel debt, cancel student debt, you know, and um, we're joining up with so many of the workers that have um, really put themselves on the front line, especially at Amazon and Instacart and uh, Whole Foods, because uh, Amazon and Whole Foods owned by Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos doesn't even give his workers paid time leave or anything like that, you know, so we're encouraging everybody to be parts of May Day. And I think I should stop there, probably. Uh, thank you so much, Rosa. Um, if you want to stop your screen. Yeah, I want to see people now. OK. I, was like, I don't know. Are people hearing me? What's good? It's a lot. You were awesome. We could see you. We could hear you. And that was probably tough. First and keynote, I got to get better at it. <laughs> It's probably better not to see yourself because it, there's, you know, so much that happens with that. Um, but thank you. So um, community, please join me in thanking Rosa. Um, Rosa, if you could see us all right now, there's um, more than 90 people here. And I imagine that there would be a ruckus round of applause and gratitude for your words. And well, thank you for having me. And just like, this is all new to me too, you know, <laughs> because I thrive off people's energy. You know, I'm, you know, that for me as a public speaker, like part of it is like, I always go the day before and I just kind of go around where the people are and get the vibe and the energy, the feel of the room. And I just have a plant right now and my daughter who I told not to interrupt me for an hour and a half. So. <laughs> well, we appreciate you being our first you know, keynote speaker ever to do Unity Week through Zoom. So um, we're going to just take a quick five minute break um, for folks to sort of get up, move around, maybe you have a class to get to, whatever it is, just enjoy this five minute pause to some great music. Um, and we'll resume in about five minutes for a Q&A session with Rosa. Um, please use the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. And we'll get going back with those in about five minutes. Welcome back, Highline family. Uh, we will now resume with questions for Rosa. Uh, we really have some excellent questions. And Gio is going to join me for the Q&A portion. Uh, also, feel free to add more questions as we go along. Um, so here we go. Hi, Gio. Hey. 
All right, so Rosa, the first question, um, what advice do you have for young scholars interested in becoming involved in community organizing and using their education to create a positive impact in their communities, but don't know where to start? Yeah, I mean, community is really like a geographical location. So it's always going to depend on where you're at, whether you're in a rural community, a city, um, what state and all of that. But I mean, no matter where you go, there's always a community organization. There's always people in a, you know, city, rural area, small town, big town. There are always issues, you know, and there's always going to be some type of community organization that you can link up with. But um, we can't do that now, you know, like, you know, that's an, that's an interesting question because it really, has just changed for us as community organizers because like i said part of being an organizer is that you're talking to people and you're meeting with people and you i mean i mean for me like i can tell immediately if that's a person i want to work with or a person that i don't want to work with just by like being around them for 30 minutes or whatever at some event you know so right now we can't really do that you know and we don't know how long we're going to be where we're at with social distancing um as they call it but you know all you could do right now is find online um and, and support like we like support the may day strike or be an artist that shares your art or you know write write your own experience that's happening i think that's as a historian i think it's really important that people document this moment in their families and in their you know household uh, because that's all we're going to be able really to do right now um yeah so say my internet connection is unstable i hope not um yes yeah, so right now you know there's so many organizations that are doing incredible incredible work especially around mutual aid and what you can do on your block because that's you know thinking bigger than that it's too overwhelming right now for even seasoned community organizers mm -hmm. yeah thank you all right thank you um the next question is for from Mariela. Um, Highland College is the most diverse college in Washington. Three fourths of students identify as a person of color. Our college is in the process of hiring our first vice president of diversity, equity, and equity uh, inclusion. In your view, what one must do and one must not do for someone in this type of role? Oh. Is someone as a vice president of equity and stuff? Yes. Okay. Um, so um, I'm like a big critic of those type of positions, although so many of my friends have positions that where they are the vice president and all of that. Um, you know, like I think it's it's problematic, but you know, this does not pertain to your institution. Your well, it could depending on who the faculty is, you know. You could be a majority um, population of people of color, but if the administration and faculty doesn't look that way, then it it it, it is very problematic, you know. And I think that the words like diversity, inclusion, are just words that are so at this point antiquated and completely dated, you know. I think they're marketing terms for universities and colleges, you know. Um, yeah, so. You know, the more and more I, I am in academia, the more and more I'm like, all of this has to change now. You know, like if the academy or the college or the university is not responding to the students' needs immediately, especially coming up in in the fall, like we're gonna see a lot of, oh, almost every institution of higher education is now trying to figure out what that's gonna look like. I mean, like, I'm, I, I taught online and I did not like it. Yeah, I was like, I don't, I don't like, you know, not seeing my students. I don't like that missing that energy. So I think a vice president coming in is going to have to really figure out what do these words mean, you know, and how are people 
especially younger people now completely now have questioned capitalism, which once the question on capitalism begins, then you, a lot of students are going to begin or should begin to understand that a lot of these universities are neoliberal, have adopted a lot of neoliberal policies, especially corporate like policies and marketing policies, you know, and that's not what higher ed is supposed to be. But um, I can't have a definitive answer because I don't know where we're going to be tomorrow or let alone September, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and I guess, you know, following up to that, that um, the same uh, question from Mariela is that so much of the DEI work at Highline, um, and I sure, I'm sure it's not um, any different places outside of Highline, but it lands on the shoulders of POC staff and faculty, and more specifically, women of color. What's up with that? Uh, what should we do about this? Um, you know, I, I, I don't see that changing. You know, in fact, I was just reading an article um, from the Chronicle of Higher Education. So for students that might not know what that is, that's like kind of the main source of information for all types of faculty administration and what jobs are out there available. And I think I might have it here. If I just share the name, maybe I don't. Okay, well, I don't. But it's the, the name of it is uh, you got your PhD, now you might not work in a college. <laughs> and, and what it really is is saying that because of the economic disaster and recession we're in, that not only have they put on hiring freezes, that a lot of people who had gotten their position to start in the fall, all of those, um, um, all of those offers have been rescinded. You know, but you know, as a woman of color, yeah, that's I know I know like all all of, all my women, all my black and brown sisters that work in all levels and all types of universities that um are in my crew i mean the main thing they always talk about is the emotional labor you know and that it is expected especially from from women of color in fact one of my friends wrote an article like i'm not your mammy i'm your professor you know and, and, and she just broke it down it goes with even students not you know respecting and calling her doctor so and so all the way to the administration really as she says they just keep you on kind of this cycle of blue ribbon panels and commissions to try to figure out something they know they have the answer to so what i, I what i think is going to happen in the fall is first universities are slashing right now left and right and they're trying to push the online um learning which a lot of students are pushing back on are saying if we're going to be online there's no way i'm paying that type of tuition you know, so I think right now in higher education, it's really the unknown um, at the moment, especially when students come back. Like they're coming back from all different states. You know, I mean, my, my belief is we're all infected. Like we all have the virus. That's my belief. Um, will it manifest in a lot of people? Probably not. But I mean, the the big group right now that's having strokes and having heart attacks are 25 to 35 year olds is what they're finding out that they have the virus but they're like they're coming out of or not being intubated but now they're dying of strokes and heart attacks so like the medical community the world health organization is like we don't even know if this thing has mutated yet so i think any type of question we have now it's going to be like, I might have the answer today, but I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You just, I don't know. I think that's a really, oh, sorry. I just think that's a really good point about, um, you know, when our students come back, thinking about where they're coming from um, and what they've been through. I think already as an institution with predominantly white faculty, we struggle with our faculty really understanding where our students are coming from and that trauma informed um, instruction and um, and care. And so really knowing that many of our students are, you know, they're already traumatized just by living in the system. But then on top of this, so coming back with just these fresh wounds um, 
it'll be super important for our institutions in higher ed to respond differently this time um, and forever. Yeah. All right. Um, your next question is from Alexis. You spoke about the transatlantic slave trade as well as the school to prison pipeline. What other systemic institutional structures would you say contribute to the disproportionate rates of Black and POC that are incarcerated? Well, I mean, um, mass incarceration is part of a system. You know, what it is is people have to study what white supremacy is and that white supremacy itself as a systemic kind of overarching um, ideology, but also implementation, it, it, it's at every level, right? So like, I'm not sure, is she trying to ask about how, why we have mass incarceration or what else affects mass incarceration? I think they want to know um, what, in what other ways are POCs and Black people are being incarcerated? are being incarcerated. Mm -hmm. What other like institutional structures contribute to that? Oh, okay, okay, that's what, all right. Um, everything, <laughs> like even the coronavirus, like it's disproportionately affecting African-American, uh, Latinos and um, native indigenous brothers, sisters and non-gender conforming people, right? So what it really is, is like, what's been happening, like, let me say the last week, it unfortunately started with Van Jones, again, kind of writing this article about if black and brown people would just eat healthier and not, not drink a lot, we wouldn't be suscept as susceptible to the coronavirus, right? So what you have now is a lot of pundits including black Latino one, black and Latino ones being like, well, if your community just ate better, you wouldn't be dying. But what really they're not talking about, right, is that poverty is the pre-existing condition to everything. If you're poorer, you might end up in jail for jumping the turnstile. If you're poorer and walking and have your mask on and there's three of you six feet apart and, you know, you're, a group of young people of color, and then across the street is a group of young white men. Um, you know, if one of the people in your group doesn't have a mask, who are the police going to go to first? Who are they going to ticket first? They're going to ticket black and brown people first. So, you know, like, there's been so many reports right now of particularly black men who have been stopped like at Target and Price Chop everywhere because they're wearing masks. But New York State, you have to wear a mask, right? And there's been so many attacks against people, Asian folks in New York and California, you know, like in LA, in the Bay, in New York City, where Asian people are being attacked, you know? So, it's not just like about mass incarceration as more, it, it, it's like, who, who will the police ever stop first, right? It's always gonna be black and brown people. Who's gonna get ticketed first? Black and brown people. It's just the way it is. It's, it sucks and it's horrible, but um, it, it, it's just predominantly, that's the society we live in now. And what this virus is showing is showing every inequity heightened, you know? Um, and so why are black and brown people dying disproportionately? It goes all the way to black women are the least believed when they go into an emergency room and say they're in pain. There was a recent Filipino brother who got turned away from four ERs and he died at the fifth one, you know, um, because the other four wouldn't let him just come in and get even triage. There's a story about a young Latino brother in California that went to one of the smaller clinics and because he didn't have insurance they didn't want to test him and six hours later he died of a massive heart attack because he had the coronavirus so what we're gonna see is actually more fascism by this carceral apparatus in this country 
because they're even talking about maybe people will have to have immunization cards to prove that they don't have the virus. But what they're preparing for us to do is to act like wearing a mask and getting your temperature anywhere you go is normal. And we're going to have to push back if that's not a public health issue. You know, so what you're seeing is the really, like I said, at the end, it's the poverty has been the pre existing condition. And any disaster is poor people first that are going to suffer. But really, this conversation at this point should be is why are we not dismantling capitalism? Because if we're not talking about dismantling capitalism, one of the stores, you know, that's what we're seeing with the, what's going on with the Tyson food um, in, in Waterloo, Ohio or Smithfield. They're talking about half their workers had the virus and their, their bosses knew they had the virus. But part of it also was that many people are undocumented. So they didn't want to go to their boss and be like, I should have a sick day, you know, because they're also undocumented people. So I went a little bigger because you can't just look at it in that one like kind of microscopic way. You know, basically people are being worked till they die. You know, basically now essential workers are important when we haven't been giving them a liberal wage or health care. It's, you know, it's a lot that's happening right now. So I think there will be a disproportionate effect on young black and brown men um, and queer folks because once the fines start, because they've opened up these states, and I'm telling you, by the end of the week, a lot of these states are going to be in trouble and they're going to implement higher, like more quarantine orders, and people are going to start pushing back. And anytime people push back, black and brown people usually get the brunt of, 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 of the kind of police state that we already have. We already have it, right? Like black men get killed for wearing hoodies. Now you're telling black men to wear masks. Like yeah. that's real. Yep. And we really have to question all these additional rules. And, you know, like you're saying, we do need to push back against what, what we're sort of accepting as um, as what's in, you know, what we're accepting as an infringement on our way of life. Um, That's uh, why we support all the frontline workers right now, you know, and it is nurses and doctors, but like I said, it's custodians and grocery workers and, you know, people that are like, look, what this country should have done would have been to pay people to stay home. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and giving 1200 people, uh, $1,200, like what rent does that pay in any big city? That's disrespectful. <laughs> disrespectful. And then getting unemployment. I've been trying to get unemployment now for five weeks. Well, you can't get through the phone lines, you know, so that's happening everywhere. So all the, all the capitalistic structures are collapsing. Mm -hmm. And this is why Trump and the people like him can say things like people want to go to work even if they're going to die or that older people are dispensable. Well, this is not just older people getting it. Mm -hmm. So we have to question it all. Yeah. All the time. That's right. So we have one final question and a couple minutes to answer it. Um, but I think it kind of adds to that question at all and what we do with this. So uh, what advice do you have for students in becoming a scholar activist? And what advice do you have for faculty and staff to nurture and support the formation of scholar activists? Well, I mean, scholar activism as a term, you know, it, it, it's been around for for a while, and it's really more um, when you see within Black studies or um, ethnic studies, Latino studies, feminist studies, queer studies, those, those departments or programs are, are, the, are usually the front line for the students of color, right? Because, you know, once you take a Black studies class and you see a Black woman who's a professor and a Native brother, sister, non gender conforming people that's teaching, you know, literature or anything like that. It changes, um, it just 
being they they said just being exposed to faculty of color empowers students you know i'm more like not just being exposed that you know why any institution at this time is a predominantly white institution not you at highland which is very rare is a crazy thought when people of color are the majority in this country in the next 10 years right so my advice is that you know whatever you're studying it should be about benefiting the community period you know so if you're being an engineer don't go work for bp gas or whatever you know like and, and that's kind of hard to say if you're going to be a lawyer do you want to be a corporate lawyer or do you want to be a lawyer a people's lawyer that fights for people's rights you know um do we want to kind of normalize now this craziness of people working and like i said not having a living wage a scholar activist is not just about your scholarship on your campus it's supposed to be about and about how you're using what you learned not to tell people what you learned but to create the vision that you see and if anything this is this is what we have to do and this goes for professors too look as a professor when i'm in a class the last class i thought taught was online but what i say in all my classes is my job is to make you an organizer if you don't want it then you can go take another class right because as a scholar activist my job is to create a space where young my, my students can not only be um challenge and challenge me but can leave as organizers in whatever they really want to hone in on and if you're an organizer it takes you a while to say wait i gotta work on this one or two issues i can't be around 11 issues but um my friend just sent me this because <laughs> He's like, every teacher, every professor right now is struggling online, you know, to do this online thing. And I'm like, no, professors should be fighting back. Like, how did all of a sudden our teachers and educators not only have to go online in like three days when 30% of the population doesn't even have a computer internet? What's the burden that we're putting on professors to do all this work while they have to take care of their families at the moment? Right, so that question falls with, within capitalism itself. Everybody should just get paid to stay at home. If the federal government can give the Federal Reserve a trillion dollars and tell us they can't just give us money to stay home, right there is the problem. But he sent me this, he said, you don't have to write the next novel. You as a professor don't have to worry about the next journal. You don't have to start that podcast, right? What you can do is observe this pause as an opportunity. That's what I think this is telling us. It's like mother nature being like, I'm giving you one more chance. <laughs> like I'm giving you one more chance to get it right. And I, I do not like seeing things where people are like, oh, now that people are staying home, the sky is clear or I can see the water. I think that's beautiful, but it's also like, well, the reason that's happening is because of this and really the water wasn't dirty because of individual people. It's because of dirty fossil fuels and all of that, you know, and it's a weird kind of thing I see online a lot, but you know that the system right now is prioritizing money and capitalism and not humanity. So we all need to be able to take a break. And let me say, I am very bad at taking my own advice. Cause I was like, I started a podcast, <laughs> I've been on 9 million Zoom calls. And I finally was just like, why do we feel the need to be super productive? <sighs> I think that's, that's because we all are, are within a capitalist system where you think if you just relax for a day, you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> where it's like, well, if you take a pause, that picture you wanted to draw or that song you wanted to write or spend six hours playing games with your kids or, you know, all of that, like, 
I, I, I don't like it, you know, and I'm struggling with myself, you know, a lot. Like I want to say no to everything. And I'm like, why am I being lazy? I'm just at home. But it's like, this is a lot of anxiety too. Cause I don't know my daughter. I don't know if she's going to go to school tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I don't know if my husband's going to get sick. I don't know if this thing's going to mutate, you know? So I know I went a little bit over, but I feel like just trying to be as authentic as I can. I definitely don't have all the answers. And, but part of me is consistently questioning why I feel the need to not work harder than ever before. And I think we end up feeling guilty, you know? So I don't, I'm not into self care as much as I'm like, what does community care look like? Like, what does it mean to check up on your friend and just be like, oh, by the way, you don't have to do anything today. You can Netflix and chill for real. You need a moment. You know, I've had to say that to a couple of my friends that are like, I'm finishing my this, this, that, and the other. I'm like, girl, you need to just spend some time with your family or just maybe sleep, you know? So we're all, it's, it's, uh, it's, I'll just end with saying in our lifetimes, we've never seen this. So there's going to be a lot of experimenting happening. There's going to be a lot of questions asked. There's going to be a lot of things that people want from us. But what I think this has really shown us is that everything that we have been fighting for, which is canceling student debt, livable wage, no gentrification, health care for all, the government is kind of doing it, right? And they mm -hmm. told us for how long? We don't have a trillion dollars to cancel. Yes, you do. In yep. fact, a trillion dollars and you cut in the Pentagon budget by half would cancel student, everybody's student debt. It would give everybody a, a, a universal basic income, which Andrew Yang definitely pushed, but universal ba basic income, Sweden, Denmark, and all these other countries have it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and third, why do we have an administration that is like, look, you guys got to get back to work. Don't you want to work? It's like, no, dude, don't you want to work? Like, <laughs> that's why a federal government exists. It exists to come into these situations. But, you know, obviously with the administration we have now, and look, I'm not saying that after November, whether he goes or he doesn't, we're still going to have to fight for canceling student debt and liberal wages and health care and hazard pay for all these workers on the front lines, you know? So, you know, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not so eloquent on that last one. It's just a lot. <laughs> it's a lot we're all dealing with, but let, I'll always be an organizer. It's in my DNA, no matter what, that's what I'm going to do. You know, and I, I surround my people, myself with people that have really good vision. And I really have a group, good group of friends that, you know, we rely on each other right now for like, what do we use this moment for? Mm -hmm. um, first, to mourn everyone who is going to continue to lose family members, but also like this might be the last breath of a capitalistic system, one that extracts or a system that extracts, extracts, including hum human labor or extracts it or uses it till it drops dead. I, at least I think a majority of us understand that more um, than we would know mm -hmm. at this moment. Oh, gives me chills. Uh, well, thank you for speaking to, you know, all of the things that I think many of us are thinking about right now and feeling and observing. Um, we really appreciate your presentation today. Um, I think we need to wrap it up. Family, Highline family, community. Um, so great to see so many people here today. Um, and again, thank you Rosa Clemente for your wisdom, your powerful message, um, and things for us to continue to chew on as we move through this moment and, and make it not just a moment, but a movement, right? A movement to get all of those things that we see states or institutions be able to do so quickly that for years they've said they couldn't. So right. this is our time to push. Yeah, and especially if anything healthcare. Mm -hmm. Because now we see, look at, I mean, two of my friends are ER doctors, one in New Orleans and one in the Bronx. And they, they're innovators, so they intubate. And they're reusing masks still. 
You know what I'm saying? I think we really have to be careful too that this moment, like people are acting like it's just what it is now. Whoever's gonna know, like if anything, it really like everything Bernie Sanders said has been true for 40 years, but man, is it truer than ever or an AOC and what they've been saying, but also what organizers have been saying forever in this country that you continue to extract you're destroying the planet you're destroying humanity and this is what will happen a pandemic and this could happen again and again and again so we really have to have different visions of what we want and we also have to really be gentle with ourselves to like you know you should if you're anxious you should be anxious and if you're having a panic attack that does not reflect on you as an individual it really reflects on a system that does not value our humanity period oh. mm -hmm. so, thank you so much for having me i really really appreciate it. it's my first one so Yay. <laughs> thank you you did it now you know how to do a zoom webinar um we want to let folks here know that we'll have um the powerpoint i think rosa you said you would share that Oh yeah, I'll send it because I added some more slides, so I'll send it to you, right? Okay. Yeah. Excellent. We'll have a recording of this video available as well, I believe, um, on our CCIE, on our Highline website for folks to follow up with. I really encourage you all to follow up with the um, organizations that Rosa mentioned and also tune in to her Disrupt the Chaos. Is that a daily thing on Facebook or? I'm going to start it tomorrow again. It's on Instagram live, but I do Facebook live it. Um, you know, so yeah, I'm restarting it back. I, we needed to get some better equipment, but yeah. And folks who follow me on Twitter, Facebook and um, Instagram. Yeah, I've been really enjoying enjoying watching those. So tune into that, folks. Um, also in the chat feature, you'll find a link for our Unity Week survey. Uh, your feedback is super critical in, in enhancing our programming, and we would appreciate it. Um, tomorrow, we have um, April 28th at 10 AM. We have another um, presentation, Unity Week event with uh, Tochi Onyabuchi. Um, we have included the Zoom hyperlink in the chat feature and you can also find it again at our our website um you're having my my girl jules on right julie yes and wednesday we have julie c and this whole organization that has just started out of you know out of this of um seattle artists of sustainability sustainability efforts something like that but uh yeah, Julie's going to be here on Wednesday talking more about mutual aid and this idea of how we take care of one another um, in times that we continue to learn that our government doesn't have us and that we are the best that we um, we are the best for one another and how we can how we can link. So uh, thank you, everybody. I guess this concludes our our session today. Um, have a wonderful rest of your day. Be safe. Take care of those around you um, and join the movement. Peace. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Stay safe.